Okay, we'll get started. So hello and welcome to this University of Leicester PG Spotlight session on social justice. My name is Alicia and I'm the UK Postgraduate Recruitment Officer here at the University. I'll be the host for today's session and my colleague Sam is on hand in the chat function to arrange, organise any questions that you might have. So please just take a moment to familiarise yourself with the team's layout. The chat function is located in sort of the top part of your screen. Um, so please do click on the chat function uh, and ask us any questions and um, feel free to say hello. Perhaps let us know where you're joining from and maybe a bit about what what you're looking for from today's session. So I'm joined today um, by staff from Criminology, Politics and International Relations, Law and the School of Business. Um, so we're going to be exploring a bit about what Master's Study and Beyond is like at the University of Leicester. Just so you know, these sessions are being recorded. You will be able to watch them back online shortly after the session. So please do keep an eye out um, on your emails for those recordings afterwards, especially if you do miss any of our other sessions that are taking place this week. So to get started, I'm going to hand over to our panel to introduce um, themselves with their name, a bit about their role and perhaps something interesting about their, their area um, of research or, or their work that they do. So Ben, am I OK to start with you? Well, straight off the bat. Hi, everyone. Yes. <laughs> um, my name is Ben Ellis. I am the Director of Admissions for the School of Criminology at the University of Leicester. Um, my field of interest is fear of crime and violence. Um, so I always say that if I if I make fear of crime and violence boring, that's on me because criminology by its nature is the very interesting thing. Uh, but I just uh, previously, just before joining this call, got off a, a call. I'm doing a piece of research with the NHS on racism in the workplace. So patients to staff racism. Um, so that will make its way eventually into the things that we teach, which would be just like my other colleagues, researching and teaching that kind of thing. That's me. That's that's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, Vlad, and I'll hand over to you next, if that's OK. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Blevin Bowen. Um, I'm the PGT Director for Politics and International Relations at the School of History, Politics and International Relations. Um, and as part of that, I oversee um, all our postgrad programmes and our three programmes across international relations broadly, um, and also in charge of admissions as well uh, for us. Um, my um, expertise is on um, astropolitics or space politics, space warfare, space security, anything political and outer space, I'm interested in it. Um, so I write books and articles on, on that sort of stuff. I also run a module at the master's level on astropolitics as well. So that'll be an option for anyone taking our three MA courses across the politics and IR uh, range. Um, so uh, and th there are social justice issues in space, just to reassure you. Um, I'm sure we can get into those in a moment. Absolutely. Thank you, Vladin. Um, Patrick, I'm going to hand over to you next. Thank you. My name is Patrick Masiakurima. I, I teach law here and I specialize in intellectual property law and company law. And of course, I am a PG um, admissions tutor, especially for the PhDs, but I teach on the Master of Laws too. And there are very strong social justice elements in, in that area, including international law, human rights and dispute resolution. That's great. Thank you. And then, Cal Stav, I'm going to hand over to you lastly. Thank you so much, Alicia. Hi, I'm Cal Stav Das. So I am the director of admissions for the School of Business, and I look after both the UG and the PG studies. So as far as our PG studies are concerned, there are two stream strands of programs we have. One is on management and the other is on accounting and finance. I am personally an economist. Uh, I work mainly on mathematical economics and mainly on something called multi-armed bandit problem. However, uh, I have used that multi-armed bandit problem in many cases. For example, I have worked with the West Midlands Police and we have actually created uh, with some of my colleagues in Birmingham who has a crime centre. It's a centre for crime, justice and policing. So I'm associated with them. And with them, we have created algorithmic approaches for the West Midlands Police. Uh, I work on political economy as well. I have a paper on how does how do people vote for people vote for the politicians, where the sympathy is important. We have empirically tested that using econometrics. So and uh, one thing I can tell about the School of Business is that, I mean, we not only educate you, we will care for you. And uh, we also put a lot of stress on your employment opportunities after that. We have an in-house career team. 
and we at every point we guide you so happy to have more discussions here thank you that's great thank you Kalsev. yeah definitely we're going to touch on some of those topics you just mentioned today so it'd be really good to explore some of those discussions but to kick things off um i was just hoping maybe somebody could kind of share a bit of um maybe some recent research areas or topics that your current master students might be exploring or looking into maybe any interesting findings or or any kind of experiences you might have had supervising some of those students so would anyone like to to sort of take the stage with that with the answer to her first question i can go about that if you absolutely that's okay. great carl Sav, yeah so uh as i said that although my background is in economics i have uh, actually supervised many master students in accounting and finance and some of the dissertation topics which people have taken over after the pandemic is that how do each of the stock markets have reacted post uh pandemic how do uh this uh stocks of the supermarkets have performed post pandemic so what i do is that so in when so one of our it's a dissertation is a compulsory thing and what we tell our students is that that a we care for the students we will teach them but at some point our responsibility is to make the students independent because they are going out in the world so dissertation is that step where you are supervised but you are set on to your own as well and in that case, what happens is that we have seen students gathering data from the databases, and sometimes they have done very original research, which is a great thing. However, given the time frame, given the maturity of the students, most of the time what they've done is that they have seen an existing paper, which might have used one of the data sets, say so for London Stock Exchange, and they've used the same methodology to see how things have gone for, say, Chinese stock exchange. So these are the some kind of things which people have done. There have been some kind of little bit on the borderline of qualitative research as well. For example, one of our students, this is pre-pandemic though, one of our students was doing a research on to see that how contactless payments actually affect people's spending behavior. So this is something which is, which is in the crossroads of management, data science, uh, accounting and finance. So uh, all I want to say is that even if you, because we have both the management strands and accounting and finance strands here, you can always benefit from the other branch branch as well when you are doing your master's dissertation. Thank you. That's really great. That's really great. So it seems there's a, a degree of sort of flexibility in that expertise and that knowledge. So um, obviously tackling some some sort of very well thought of societal issues as well, which, which is really great to hear from from a master's student. It's brilliant. Um, maybe Bladen can hand over to you if you wanted to to sort of talk about any recent work. Yeah, sure. So. Um... Um, I mean, I've, I've got two spreadsheets in front of me, mm -hmm. and unlike many spreadsheets, these are actually quite intellectually stimulating spreadsheets because it's the list of topics of um, our MA students have uh, made over the last couple of years, um, and you know, it's 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 a very very you know very wide variety of topics and. It reflects our three MA programs. So we have the International Relations MA, International Security Studies, and Human Rights and Global Ethics MA. Um, now, the latter is the most directly related um, to today's theme of, of social justice, but um, you can mix and match all your modules pretty much. What your um, program choice does is define your core module. Um, and then your dissertation would have to be in some way related to the core topics in the human rights global ethics case if you if you try if you choose to do the HRGE masters and um, the topics I have um, here. Um, so there was one last year on um, um, analyzing the UK government legislation on um, um, Romani gypsy and traveler communities and asking is it actually a racist policy? For example, towards that particular uh, those groups of, of minorities, um, there was another dissertation on the discourse around sexual violence at UK universities. Um, others, uh, there's another one here on um, normative theory in international relations, which is a, a very ethically and moral theory driven approach to international relations, and using that to analyze specific case studies and how refugees are handled at various border checkpoints around the world. Um, there was another project on the inmates' rights of um, 
uh, of the rights of LGBTQ inmates. So even just within the um, human rights and global ethics uh, focus uh, of our programmes, um, you can see the wide diversity of projects there. But beyond that, looking towards our security and international relations masters, um, there was one great dissertation I read last year, uh, which I also supervised, but I thoroughly enjoyed it, which was on um, comparing and contrasting the approaches of West Germany and Japan to the question of US nuclear weapons in their own military strategy in the early Cold War, because both West Germany and Japan considered whether they should have their own nuclear weapons programs. Um, and how they would manage their relationship with the United States. Um, there was a project also on um, Qatar and the 2022 FIFA World Cup um, and the international politics around that. Um, and surprisingly, there's increasing interest on Russia and European security or rather insecurity and focusing now on the Ukrainian uh, situation. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine, very, very, um, you know, hot topic and people respond to what's happening right now, which is what's always interesting to see as, as a program director, because I get to see what everybody's up to. Um, security issues in sub-Saharan Africa, um, Asian politics. Um, there was one project on um, COVID-19 legislation uh, as well. So, so that's just a snapshot and there's a lot of freedom within certain programs um, onto what you want to focus on. And it also shows the breadth of expertise that we have here in politics and international relations to provide actual support um, on that. And uh, um, I mean, if you do any space projects, I'll be supervising that as a dissertation supervisor, unsurprisingly. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Blaine. It's so amazing to see that range. And uh, again, similarly to what I said to, to Kyle those really key societal issues or, or debates that are happening at the moment, which is really, really great. And it aligns really nicely with, like you said, the work that you and your colleagues are doing. Um, it's really at the forefront of that knowledge, which which is great. And to see um, projects that are taking place on, on current affairs as well. Um, like you said, the, the situation in Russia with Russia and the Ukraine, that is um, just such a testament to kind of that forefront. Um, which which is really great. So, um, Ben, did you want to kind of come in? I guess maybe I don't know if you and Bladen have some sort of similar um, sort of opportunities to talk about some of these things. I know that, that a couple of the issues Bladen perhaps spoke about might sort of relate to, to criminology quite nicely as well. Absolutely. What what I love is the fact that there's so much crossover. Obviously, we've been clumped together for very good reasons, but there's lots of crossover. Um, I was just trying to think because with our undergrad courses, they tend to be quite UK centric in terms of the things that we teach because it's based around. UK crime, UK criminologies, there are elements of globalisation, but then with the master's courses, it becomes a much more global endeavour, which kind of reflects our student cohort. So just a couple of the um, the dissertations and projects that I can think of, we have a student called Kane, who is hopefully going to be applying for a PhD with us as well. So we, we're having conversations at how we can develop his thesis into a PhD thesis, but he is from Guatemala. Uh, he works for Guatemalan security forces and his his thesis is based around the um, essentially a thing called evidence-based policing, but the evidence-based policing around high profile abductions. So people from wealthy families in Guatemala are abducted and then ransomed back uh, to their families or to organizations and about the, the process of gathering intelligence to be able to locate those people. Um, he has gathered data um, around the, the length of time that it goes between the incident happening and reporting between success and failure of getting someone back because some people disappear forever and some people come back. So it's quite a pragmatic project, but looking at a, a genuine local problem, but how in an under-resourced environment like Guatemala um, that doesn't have um, full geographic or 24 hour a day policing from the government, um, how that's how um, intelligence led policing is able to sort of contribute to success within those those fields. Um, but also I have a, um, a Ghanaian student called Alberta who is interested in how um, diasporic traditions can contribute to um, domestic violence situations within the UK. So she's someone who's lived half her life in Ghana and half her life in the UK, um, but is interested in sort of diasporic um, interpretations of um, familial relationships and how that can sometimes be at odds with um, 
say UK um, legislation, UK law around um, behaviours within families and that kind of thing. But it comes from a, an internal cultural perspective, so quite a sensitive look at a sensitive topic. Um, but all of these things, again, these these are things that. So when it comes to violence, I can supervise these things. But the the ideas come from the students, and that's the the beauty. I think colleagues have alluded to this already that. Um, the students come in, especially with our master's students, they come in with such great ideas and it's just a case for us as staff to to be the conduit that we can just sort of thread those things through. I know what a dissertation and a research project is supposed to look like, but until I started supervising Alberta about about the diasporic needs of, of uh, you know, Ghanaian immigration, I have no idea. Um, so we learn together and I'm again trying to convince her to stay on to do a PhD, but we can talk about where they go once they've come to us afterwards because it's not absolutely all yes yeah definitely i think that is something we'll, we'll probably pick up on in the next sort of question and then actually maybe towards the towards the end of the session um, it'd be great to sort of talk about the student body that you have when you know when they join you uh, where maybe, maybe some of the, the different experiences and walks of life that people have come from so i think that'd be a really good thing to, to unpick a little bit later on so thank you for that ben and then patrick i'll hand over to you about kind of research areas um within your school yes so there is a wide range of research areas. So recent thesis had covered corporate governance in its domestic and international spheres. Then there have been dissertations on artificial intelligence and intellectual property law, patents and access to essential medicines. Then in the broader social justice area, there has been discussion on of the Windrush program and immigration law. And of course, in common with other schools, there is a lot of training for students. So students come in with a very wide topic or a wide campaign, but there is training on research methods and on how to handle research. And, and in the end, some of the dissertations are, are excellent and, and lead to further study at the PhD level. But there are wider areas and international law tends to attract broad international issues and human rights in their domestic and international context are also discussed. But for other students, they really like the intersection between general commercial law and, and social justice. So for example, there's a dissertation looking at Chinese mining activities in, in Southern Africa and how the environmental wrongs that are committed in those countries can be redressed in Britain where the parents, parent companies could be located. So there are a lot of things and you get a lot of support if you were to do a dissertation in the law school and the marking is rigorous but fair. That's amazing. No, that's great. And again, we're bringing in that sort of real cross-disciplinary um, interest there. So if people are kind of coming from various different um, avenues in life, they can explore those topics that, that perhaps they have previous experience or knowledge in. So that's something, again, like I said, we'll, we'll pick up on shortly. But to kind of think about maybe projections beyond master's study. I know we've talked about obviously PhD, going on to do a PhD is, is perhaps sometimes an obvious outcome, but um, what do you find that this may be variable across different schools? What do you find students go on to do next? Um, you know, what, what do you feel that uh, are common routes for students to go into uh, maybe different industries or, or like you said, further study? So did anyone want to sort of take that one first? Um, Bladen, I can see you, you've got your hand, yeah. Yeah, sure. I can get started on that. Um, yeah, so um, as as you mentioned, PhDs, um, we've been quite successful recently in politics and IR with um, external funding from places like M4C, Midlands Four Cities, but also internal with um, University of Leicester PhD funding. Um, one is on um, human trafficking in South Africa and another is on um, sexual orientation and gender identity in asylum claims and so those are two examples of successful funded PhD projects from our now well soon to be graduating MA students mm -hmm. but beyond that um, it's it, it's one of the most difficult questions I get as when yeah. I'm talking to people about politics and IR degree of any kind whether undergraduate or masters because it's it's not a program that's really geared to, towards one particular line of work because you get so many transferable skills and just a general knowledge as well as whatever areas of specialism you choose to focus on. You could go off in any in any direction really. Um, you know, 
if you do my space politics module, you could even go to outer space one day, possibly. But I've not had mm -hmm. a former student become an astronaut just yet. <laughs> um, but um, so in terms of careers, though, um, civil service is um, obviously one of the one of the big ones. And um, and especially in terms of the security side, um, working for Ministry of Defence, the intelligence services uh, as well, um, whether UK or abroad, especially you know, for international students. Um, or even just um, general civil service work, whether it's um, in the national civil service, um, supranational civil service for EU passport holders want to work in the European Union, um, or even local government, whether it's um, local in England or the devolved administrations and devolved parliaments um, here, here in the UK. Um, the transferable skills by working with policy issues and politics broadly um, gives you the wide range of activities and um, in my own space module I have a um, one of my assessments is to write up a uh, executive briefing document or, which is basically like a space agency report and you've got a new science minister and you need to write a report about this space agency to the new science minister and it's having more applied work and assessment there's also the more academic traditional essay assessment as well but that's an example of how we try to get you to talk to uh, and write in ways that isn't just about the academic uh, side of things um one of our former students um got a job very quickly after after his masters working uh, again um the same student i mentioned with the um romani gypsy traveler uh, research. He got a job working for um, a charity, working for Romani Gypsy Traveller Rights, and very quickly in that job actually used his research in his master's to provide evidence to the House of Lords in an investigation they were doing at the time. Um, so um, I think he's now got a TV show on Channel 4, actually, about archaeology. So um, so he's, he's he's doing very well. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really, really great. It's great to see um, how people are using that experience from their masters and taking it through to their careers. Yes, yes. Yeah. So so there's that. Um, but, you know, many people go into, into business, they find business opportunities, policy research, large consultancy companies, any anything that works with politics and policy in terms of research, you will find careers there. So, um, yeah, it's it's difficult to pin it down to one yeah. thing, really, that people <laughs> end up in all sorts of places after our degree. So we always love to hear from our alumni. Yeah, no, that's really, really great. I think that's something that's come through actually in other sessions as well, is that often there's this misconception that that you're doing postgraduate study sometimes pigeonholes you or confines you into one certain area. But actually, I think what we're seeing is it's quite the opposite. It opens lots of different doors and lots of different avenues and gives you, like you said, those transferable skills to be able to to move into different environments. And um, I think it's getting that message across that I think is such a key to, to postgraduate study, really. It, it doesn't kind of you become a specialist by all means. You, you start to specialise and, and really gain that knowledge and insight. But it does open doors. And I could see I could see Ben nodding along a lot, a lot through through when um, you were talking there. Blood. And so maybe Ben, did you want to come in and kind of um, maybe talk about some similar career pathways? Absolutely. I mean, it was also my personal experience. I finished an undergrad degree. Um, I didn't really know where I was going to go with anything. So I did a I did a postgraduate degree and that led to the the long chain of events that led me to be sat in this chair, which sort of I I think I ended up temping at a um I was doing some data entry for the police force and the three week contract came to an end and they said, does anybody know how and then thanks for doing the data entry. We now need someone to analyze the data. So I was like, well, I can I can do that. And they said, I would now need someone to present the data after another month. And I said, OK, I think I can do that. And eventually I became full time employed and then ended up working for the Home Office. And it was actually the work that I did, the research that I did for Home Office projects that made me want to come back into academia. So I kind of went in out and then sort of came back in again. But much like colleagues, I think Obviously, further study is something for people that are minded in that direction, and, and it can be both funded and unfunded study. Um, but for criminology, there are some fairly um, potentially standard routes that people might take. So security, policing and probation. But security is a very broad topic, and I know that it will cross over with other people. So um, a master's student um, who is a, a, a during pandemic master's student um, ended up getting a job in um, in a bank, but he was basically essentially cyber security for banking transactions, um, but it was actually based initially in Cayman and then moved to Australia. So um, his career choices were obviously better than mine. But mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's using something that he was he was a mature student as well, came from India 
um, but had a wealth of experience and used the masters as the conduit to get into that thing. So it was that extra thing that he needed. Um, so our, our masters cohort tend to be um, a mix of people that have come straight through undergraduate study, but also people coming back in to study for professional development, that kind of thing, especially our, our international students are often potentially serving law enforcement officers or, or potentially serving governmental officers as well, who will see it as a way to gain promotion or, or, or gain um, sort of critical theoretical skills that might help them within the course of their work as well. Um, a lot of our students also go into third sector organisations, so potentially um, crime and justice related charities, so things like the Innocence Project. Um, sometimes that further study can be more vocational, so we have lots of people doing law conversion courses, so joining um, joining the bar, um, which is quite a common thing as well, but also going into government. Um, again, it's not unlike colleagues have said already or other other research organisations, but the, the world is essentially your oyster with these sorts of things that a lot of the skills are very transferable into other environments and um, the types of assessments, as, as, as already been said, the types of assessments do try to prepare people for what they will be doing in, in the real world. Um, and I've certainly found in no matter what my job has been, there will always be some kind of data analysis, both qualitative and quantitative, and the need to present that data to um, the up above and to whoever else needs to be um, convinced of what you're trying to say. Um, but all of those skills come through. Um, but I, I often, I, I do stay in touch with the the um, PG students when they leave, and I'm often quite jealous about the exciting things that they go on to do. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I want to stay in touch because they're going to be yeah. great research contacts, access to, to these fantastic organisations and the types of things that they do. It's just really exciting. I'm Absolutely, sure yeah. Like, yeah, lots of people, um, you know, throughout these sessions, we've kind of ascertained that, you know, lots of colleagues do keep those really close ties with their PG students. Like you said, it's, it's diversifying, di diversifying the network and, and creating some really great links um, that, that people keep between the University of Leicester and perhaps their, their, their sort of new employment, which is really good. Carl, I was going to hand over to you to, to perhaps talk about it because you're... Um, the, the sort of courses that you offer might actually lend themselves to slightly different uh, environments that we've talked about. Yes, so uh, we have, uh, so in the School of Business, we often have people who have not done their first degree in those uh, management or accounting and finance. We have students with engineering backgrounds and we do have people from economics and management background as well. So uh, the School of Business has an in-house career team where there are people who actually help you to write their own CVs, right? And many of the people, uh, our students after graduating, they join places like JP Morgan, Bloomberg, etc. And for the accounting and finance students, every year we have something called an investment conference. We're leading people from the industry. They come and they give a talk, deliver a talk. And one of the other options career in the career uh, path we have is that uh, there are teams, there is a specialized people who actually guide the students how to do startups. So we have this variety of things. And finally, people do often go for PhD as well. That is not too high. However, as far as accounting and finance is concerned, or if some, some person, because these are all boundaries are not very diffuse between accounting and finance and economics. At some point, there are courses are different, but at the same time, there can be diffuse boundaries. Mm -hmm. So for accounting and finance, people, if they want to go for economics PhD in us, we have a separate training program for the PhDs. They have to go through that. So uh, that's one of the things with the School of Business that we have people going for careers in every kinds of places like in corporate, finance companies, financial analyst, government, and also to a higher academy as well. And we are open to everything. So we support students, whatever path they want to take. That's great. Thank you, Kelsof. Yeah, it's, it's very much, again, that opening doors sort of mentality and, and that provision that I think both Bledin, and Ben, Kelsof, you've all sort of spoken about that integration of those skill sets into your programme. So actually supporting students into those um, those careers. I think that's that's really great. And Patrick, I'm just going to hand over to you kind of to talk about that because you might you might have a, again, a slightly different take on maybe what students do after they've done their, their master's course. Oh, there, there are obvious similarities between yeah. what our students do and what students do in other areas. There is a dedicated careers tutor who help students 
with their career planning, CVs and filling in application forms. And of course, there are numerous transferable skills. Law is a very broad subject. And of course, such skills the opportunity to work in different areas, including non-governmental organizations, law firms, multinational corporations. And of course, for international law students, most of them perhaps work in the area of diplomacy or may work for regional bodies. And some students also pursue further studies or actually join investment banking firms because they would have acquired the commercial awareness that may be relevant for, for such activities. So there is a very wide range of careers and the LLM especially facilitates those careers because students can choose four modules and then they have a dissertation, which means that they can either go via the research route or through formal employment. No, that's great. Thank you. Something I wanted to kind of move maybe the session towards was maybe talking about some of those differences between undergraduate study and postgraduate study. Sometimes this can be difficult. I'm often asked about this when, when I'm out and about talking to prospective students and what does that look like? How does that sort of take form? Sometimes it's difficult if you haven't experienced postgraduate study before to understand what that actually looks like, maybe from a day to day point of view, content point of view, studying and exam side of things. So um, I can see, Kelsey, you've got your hand up. I can hand over to you first. I think this is such a good topic to, to, to sort of unpick a bit. So, yeah. Thank you so much. So, uh, so actually, you know, uh, business, economics, accounting and finance or management, they have one feature that we can start at any level. Only difference is that whenever we start, we start at a level as if people know nothing. But in the undergraduate level, we actually swim shallow. At the postgraduate level, we actually swim a bit deeper. And there are instances where we have had accounting and finance PhD students who are from a completely different background, with more deeper. So uh, that's the thing we have. That's why we don't have any requirements of doing a particular first degree or undergraduate degree to come to a specific postgraduate program, because all of our faculty members, they assume zero knowledge. But for example, we do say that, of course, English proficiency is needed sometimes. And that's the language with, in which we, we communicate. And uh, also, if a person is doing the accounting and finance program, we do say that you don't have to be a mathematical wizard. But at the same time, you shouldn't be afraid of numbers. You shouldn't be afraid of mathematical models. So as long as you have had some kind of likings for mathematics in your school level or high school level and uh, numbers do not put you down you can join accounting and finance so that's the only one thing which we just a statutory thing we say mm -hmm. to our students because and i feel it's for the benefit of the students only because we don't want to teach anything to the students which they will not find it valuable yeah. So we don't want to make it too easy for them. I mean, they might have a temporary myopic benefit of being happy. They get a good point grades, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't like we wouldn't like to be myopic like myopic yeah. when our students are concerned. So we do say that uh, you need some kind of liking for math thing if you want to join the accounting and finance thing, because in accounting and finance, mostly nowadays, uh, operating software packages to handle data is very important. Mm -hmm. And where don't you need data? I think Ben needs data for criminology. Ledwin needs, need data. Sociologists need data nowadays. I mean, this crossroads is so, I mean, as I said, the boundaries are so diffuse. So I was really surprised to see that when I have two colleagues from other departments and I just found, OK, I have done some kind of research with about which I can talk to both these colleagues. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing which we think that. Uh, we assume zero knowledge, but you have to keep an open mind because a lot of engineering students come to us. For mm -hmm. example, many of the engineering students, uh, they join our management program and we have a module called business economics. Where we teach this, we have 700 or 800 students in each of the cohort sometimes. So where we teach without assuming any prior knowledge. Yeah. So yeah. that's one of the things which we have. That's and great. We also have we also have remediary help for if some students need more help in math, we have that provision as well. 
Thank oh, that's really great. Thank you, Kelsey. No, that's really good. Um, Bladden, I'm going to hand over to you for some of those differences. Um, obviously, we may have people who are watching this who, who maybe actually have studied, uh, you know, politics and international relations as an undergraduate. And how does that sort of translate? How does that look different for them? Uh, yeah, so um, many of our masters will have done something in in politics or history or international relations before doing a masters in it. Not that you have to, um, but many many have. And um, the the biggest distinction in the way we teach a, a masters as opposed to an undergraduate is that a masters is um, pretty much entirely taught via seminars, no mm -hmm. lectures. And that really shows where the emphasis is more on you as an independent, a more independent researcher and reader, where the seminar is there to discuss what everybody's been reading um, and what you think of the readings, um, using the readings as the basis for a very in-depth and detailed conversation where, you know, unlike a lot of undergraduate programmes, the you know if, when I'm a tutor in an MA seminar, I'm very much just facilitating a conversation mm -hmm. I'm not there leading it or directing it it's just more of a moderator than anything else but you know yeah. pitching in as necessary um and um you know dispensing advice on assessments that sort of thing but but that requires a lot more reading so the contact mm -hmm. hours is re reduced on an MA level for us but that means you will need to be spending more time reading so that's sort yeah. of the single biggest change however for people who are new to international relations or the, the subjects we cover in our three programs, um, we do we do create the modules with, you know, the the attitude of this will be accessible to people who are from the social sciences generally or the humanities, and will be able to pick it up as they go along, and because they get everything they need in the core modules that we provide mm -hmm. in semester one. Um, so as Custer was saying, there is a bit more of a learning curve if you're new to the subject of the MA, but it's not yeah. impossible. And many people do sort of defect to international relations yeah. after doing something quite different in their undergraduate years. Um, but um, also because we are a comprehensive you know, department, we do politics and IR in many ways across our undergraduate program where if you find an undergraduate module you actually want to audit you can sit in on the lectures or access the recordings so mm -hmm. my again my space module it my master's space module runs in tandem with my third year final undergraduate year um, space module as well and I strongly encourage my students to watch my undergraduate lectures because space is a brand new subject to everyone who chooses to take it yeah. um, you know because we're not scientists you know we're social scientists we're humanities scholars um, and space is a totally brand new thing to everyone in our social social universe um, so you can uh, you can audit a lot of undergraduate material as well to assist your MA studies as well. Um, and it's at the master's level, as you were saying earlier, uh, Alicia, that um, you do get to demonstrate a growing expertise in, in yeah. specific areas, but that doesn't restrict you either. So so it's more about you developing as an independent researcher mm -hmm. that um, obviously, with guidance, we don't leave you to yeah. get on with it. <laughs> um, but obviously, in conversation, um, you know, you do need to be interested in the subject um, and uh, you need to keep reading and find your own way to organise your own work. Because if you are to become a competent and talented researcher in the, as a career, you need to be able to structure your own work in your own way because you will be left alone. Mm -hmm. to go and read very very big things over a set period of time yes absolutely um i think i touched on with some colleagues previously that, that often undergraduate study can maybe maybe feel more in this sort of sponge sort of phase where you're taking lots and lots of information in but actually postgraduate study evolves that into your own independent thoughts and discussions and i think that the fact that you know you operate on a seminar basis is fantastic and it's that sort of melting pot of people with different experiences as well that are coming together to, to share that information and oh just, just to add um mm. a, a seminar um is usually between um five and 15 people so mm -hmm. that's the size of our classes so in terms of you know why yeah. why a celeste our class sizes are not very large on the ma level so you get to know everyone including your tutors very well by the end yes. of your masters 
Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's another thing we can maybe touch upon is that 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 relationship with your your supervisor, um, your personal tutor does change from how that is perhaps at undergraduate level. And um, like you said, often we take on larger undergraduate cohorts, but at that postgraduate level, you become kind of more discussion points and you have that kind of different conversation. Um, you're not necessarily a student who is always being led by, um, you know, an academic member of staff. It's more that conversation. And I think, Ben, you sort of mentioned this earlier in a really nice way that you were learning from your students just as much as they were kind of learning from you. I think that's such a wonderful thing. So did you want to kind of come in and, and maybe talk about those differences? Absolutely. I I, I mean, I, I echo everything that colleagues have said. Um, absolutely. I, I find, and again, I don't know how colleagues feel about it, but I love teaching master's students. It's, it's so stimulating in a way that is different to undergrad. It's not, there's no, no one that's better, but it is very stimulating because master students by definition are a self-selected group of people um so by and large people that are in the room really want to be in the room and they have chosen to be in the room at a you know at a, a higher level than they would have done as an undergrad or if they're coming in with professional experience there is a very specific reason for being in the room and in in terms of me learning from my students so um, my first ever master's class was about comparative international policing and i had students from Malaysia, the Philippines, from China, from India, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from the UK, um, from Ireland, everybody in a room. Um, and you can ask one question and you can spend an hour on it. And everybody is giving their input into that thing. It's all very guided. It's all with a specific purpose. But I, you know, I don't have direct experience of working in the Chinese police. I don't know what that kind of thing would be like. Some people come from authoritarian more authoritarian countries some some come, come from countries that don't have 24 hour or 100 percent geographic policing those are interesting things and we all meet on the same discussion point how are these things done and it it, it is obvious that that i can learn from those those processes because i can then know what to expect next time round and that kind of thing but also just um just soak up what people are saying and the same thing is true both in a in an academic environment but also in terms of the social structures you know leicester is something i love about leicester not being a native of the county or the city that um you can you can walk into town from campus and you can see every face you can hear every accent you can hear every language and every single religion is represented in the city so you can find your your comfort, your place within the university. It's a very welcoming environment, just quite naturally as a city, but that is true of our postgraduate community as well. So you don't have to be restricted by staying within topic. Um, I always say criminology is a convergent topic and not a subject because you can pretty much be anything and be a criminologist. Um, but the same is true of our of our postgraduate community. Um, and you will find friends that are not on your course that will then be able to um, either you know be a, a social friend or be somebody that can help you to find an, a new academic way um, of doing things and you can understand the different types of support that are necessary so um, much like bled in our, our classes are relatively small um, for our core lessons we might have up to 50 but then for our option modules as, as they as they choose um, might be as few as um, 10 or as few as five um, but then it might be a very different experience if you're if you're in a very large cohort um, but there, there are benefits and um, and beauties to all of those things because um, we still do lectures and things. But I've done lectures to five people, which is, feels yeah. like a very odd experience. But yeah. um, but it becomes more of a conversation thing there. But yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Some of those kind of barriers or or maybe walls that you may have experienced at an undergraduate level do tend to, you know, tend to come down when you're in postgraduate study. Uh, so that's that's really great. Patrick, is there anything you'd like to add to to kind of this this area? Yes, there is a slight difference between law and other disciplines. For law at the undergraduate level, the focus is twofold. Firstly, there is an emphasis on preparing students for the requirements of various law societies so that they can practice as law. Mm -hmm. Yes, but at the postgraduate level, then there is greater flexibility in terms of methodologies of subjects and specialization because there is no longer that imperative to to become a practicing lawyer so again in common with other areas there is small group seminar teaching and there is a lot of help for students offered by personal tutors and the module conveners and there are numerous methodologies which are employed which can appeal to different students and and of course as was said earlier you see, there is an 
an international community of, of students who can then influence each other's outlooks in terms of looking at a particular subject. So we have had students in company law, which I teach, from Oman, the UAE, from Africa, India, China, and all the like. And what then happens is that we all get ideas on how businesses are managed at the legal level in all these different jurisdictions. And that is especially helpful to the person teaching the course too, because then they get acquainted with developments which they would not otherwise follow in their day-to-day -day activities. That's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, it's really good to kind of make those distinctions um, about the differences maybe in law to, to, to other schools. So that's really great. Thank you. So we are kind of drawing towards the end of the session. So we have kind of got a few sort of final questions. I just wanted to say if you are watching the call and you wanted to, to ask any uh, of our staff here today any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, that, that's great. And it's nice to hear from some of you say, saying hello. Um, I think one thing I just wanted to maybe touch upon that we, that we have sort of um, alluded to in some of our conversations is actually that level of support. Obviously, postgraduate study is very rigorous uh, and, and often, like you said, it comes with a lot of uh, independence. Uh, um, and in some cases, that that is a challenge, that master's study in itself is a, is a challenge. How do we, you know, within your respective schools, do you support students? Um, I know that at Leicester, we operate a personal tutor scheme. So, you know, feel free to share experiences if you are a personal tutor. But But how do you kind of support students on that journey from a pastoral point of view from an academic point of view and so on so i don't know who'd like to take that maybe bladden would you like to to go first yeah sure sure so um yeah so so that you're absolutely right there are systems in place um you're not uh, left alone as it were when you do need to read a lot by yourself but you're not left alone uh by, by, by any means so yes we do have the personal tutoring system and the way it works in our uh, in our side of things um as the postgraduate director i'm the personal tutor for all um of our ma students on the politics and ir side so um i get to know the cohort very well and then uh, vice versa so that's one avenue of support where um, 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 often it's just a matter of checking in, seeing, you know, how you're doing, things going okay, settling into Leicester, um, you know, like Ben, uh, you know, it may shock you to hear that I'm not from Leicester, um, not even from England. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm also a newcomer to Leicester, well, relative, no, actually over five years now, but I'm not from Leicester myself, but uh, so I know what it's like to move to Leicester. Um, and uh, so it can just be very informal like that. But also then uh, if you say you get your first uh, assessments back and there may be stuff to work on academically, then we can put together plans to, you know, how to improve on it. And then that can be in conjunction then, then with your module tutors, the person who actually marked your work. We also have the English language teaching unit at the university. So for anyone who wants to have um, more support with um, English reading, writing and, and also academic academic writing skills support in particular and referencing um there are the English language teaching units does a lot of great work in giving like targeted support one-to-one -one support there as well um so as well as me as personal tutor um and also being the first point of call for any um any personal problems that may affect your studies uh, you know life happens uh, to all of us and um uh, you know it's sadly not uncommon for things to happen in people's lives that directly affect their ability to study so i'm one of the first points of call that then gets you the help and support that you need then um for for whatever it is um that's happening so so there's me as personal tutor you have your module tutors who can give you the targeted support specific to the modules and then you're also given a dissertation supervisor with us at the start of the second semester so late january early february depending on your dissertation topic you will be given a dissertation supervisor that um either is in your specialist area or closely related to it um if we're not if there's no complete match um in terms of the topic but they are then your supervisor from early february until you submit your dissertation at the end of september and um, you know, we recommend you meet them at least three times properly, uh, but often you meet them a lot more than that and as as necessary as well. Yeah. And you can meet, you'll be meeting them over the summer as well. So we don't leave you alone over the summer either. Um, so the support systems are there throughout. Um, but additionally, um, it's, you know, the personal teaching system is there. But if you actually prefer to speak to another member of staff, 
you are totally free to do that as well because sometimes you develop a rapport with certain members of staff that you're more comfortable talking to about various things um so so that's a sort of an idea of the additional support and then uh, and that's just sort of within the department really mm -hmm. so so the eltu the english language teaching unit and there's all sorts of well-being services from across the university then that you can also rely on uh, you know if if you encounter additional difficulties that's great thank you Bladen. and yeah thank you for highlighting some of those university-wide support networks as well i think they're really important so if you are kind of looking into to those um you know the eltu and the wellbeing service you can find information on our website about those if you want to sort of learn a bit more about them oh and uh, on uh, in our induction week uh, we have some great stuff from our library team as well so the library staff have some mm -hmm. great orientation and introduction materials so you know if you're quite new to the british university system um you know the library is fantastic in getting you orientated in how you know basic library functions here at leicester work uh, as well so um there's just there's lots of stuff we put into induction week to orientate you but you can always chase things up with us afterwards as well it's just a matter of come to speak to us and uh, I like to think we're approachable by email yeah, <laughs> and no. you, you know we have a um, drop in hours every yeah. week as well uh, twice a week here um, so there's there are two hours a week I have where I will be in my office and you can drop in without an appointment so we have that sort of stuff as well so you can just if something happens just come in and we'll see what we can do to help you. That's great. Um, I guess in the interest of time, are there any kind of house of Ben, uh, Patrick, are there any things that you want to maybe highlight from within your schools that maybe are slightly different to Blood? And I know he's obviously touched upon quite a few things within the school and the university. Is there anything else that you feel like maybe your school um, has that's slightly different? Well, uh, thank you, Alicia. So I think what Bladin has already said that, I mean, this uh, general university support is always there. Mm, yeah. So I would like to mention a couple of things. First is that so all our module leaders hold office hours every week and that's free drop in for students mm -hmm. and second is it is related to the accounting and finance students so since we assume no math background what we do is that before their curriculum starts uh, just a couple of weeks before we have an intense crash course on math mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah. and I have uh, myself taught that for two years, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, yeah. everything. So we do that and uh, we have office hours for that course as well. That's so great. So that support is also also there for the, just to uh, let people who are yeah. interested in finance to know yeah. that we have that support in place. It's a module, but it's not graded. I mean, it's, yeah. it doesn't add to your uh, final marks, yeah. but we teach all the things we see you would need to do the relevant modules. So no, that's, that's what I wanted to add. That's Thank great. You. That's really Thank good. You. Thank you. That's again that additional academic support. So that's that's brilliant. And um, Ben, did you want to kind of add anything on that or do you have sort of similar practices as well? Yeah, very similar. I, I think it's been really comprehensive for what, what mm. the have said. Um, I suppose the other thing is, is to, you know, not, not everybody has always avails themselves of the things that are available to them in terms of support. So I suppose it's one of those things that, um, as I've said, it is a it is a more mature learning environment than the undergrad learning environment, and therefore you can expect potentially a more mature relationship with the the person that's assigned as your supervisor or as your um, either through um, pastoral things or through through learning things. So more is expected of you as a student in terms of your ability to to communicate both written verbally and and learn that kind of thing. But you know you can also expect a more mature level of care when you come to us because you know mm. people come from all over the world um and not just all over the uk um so yeah i think it's it's um we will as far as possible be sensitive to your cultural needs as well and the kinds of ways that you want to be communicated with um so i always try to when i have my personal duties come and see me i say right how how do you want me to communicate with you some mm -hmm. people want to have deadlines set and some people just are fine to be completely independent. They'll see them yeah. once at the beginning of the year, and then I'll ask them if they're okay, they'll tell me they're fine, and then they'll finish, and they'll be absolutely fine. So some people need you, some people don't, but um, we're able to adapt to whatever whatever you need as a student. That's great, thank you. And then Patrick, very, very briefly, did you want to kind of jump in on that? And then we've got one sort of very final, quick little, quick fire question before we finish the session. Right. So I'll hand over to you, Patrick. Yes, so I think most of the things have been alluded to. So we have also what are called Master of Law study skills. So for those students who um, from 
jurisdictions where they would not have written essays in the British format at least. Mm -hmm. There are study skills which are um, offered by numerous members of staff and there are also dissertation uh, writing skills. So you will be looked after on the academic front, but at the personal level there is a lot of pastoral help too and by a dedicated team in the law office and by personal tutors and module conveners. That's great, thank you. So I'm just going to sort of share this as a final slide and give you all a moment just to think um, whilst I sort of share some information with our attendees. Um, I'm going to pose this sort of question to you to sum up uh, postgraduate study at Leicester in one or two words. I'm going to keep it really, really brief, so one or two words only. Um, but just whilst you're having a think of those words, I'll sort of talk to our attendees kind of about what's next. Um, so our PG spotlights will be taking place until tomorrow. We have um, a session following this one and also one tomorrow as well, where you can find out more about other subjects too. Um, these are all being recorded, so they will be out soon on YouTube, um, so you can catch up on anything that you've missed. Um, applications for our PGT courses are open, and we would really recommend if you're looking for September or October 2023 entry. Please apply sooner rather than later. You will be able to find the deadlines on course pages for those applications. So, so please do check out um, our website for that. On our website, you'll also find entry requirements, um, funding and scholarship options too. Um, so again, if you scan the QR code on the right hand side, that will take you to our main page and you will find lots of information there. You'll also find the search for a course function, so um, lots of the courses, all of the courses that we've spoken about today um, and in other sessions as well, you'll be able to find those through our search function and there's a button below it as well to chat to students and staff. Um, you can find a variety of different student blogs or maybe things like accommodation, what the University of Leicester's like and um, what the City of Leicester's like as well. So please do kind of keep in touch with the university um, through your application process. So if you are kind of um, stuck at any point, please do reach out to our admissions teams. They will be able to support you with that process, um, especially in relation to things like visa status um, and English language teaching um, courses prior to starting as well. So, so please kind of do keep in touch with us throughout that process as well. So as a quick fire round, uh, we're going to sort of sum up master's study at the University of Leicester in one or two words. So um, who is ready to go? Does anyone have their sort of words ready? Ben, you're sort of smiling, so I'm going to hand over to you first. Well, you put us on the spot. It depends. Yeah. So I'm going to say <laughs> expertly guided. Amazing, that's great. Thank you. Kyle Stav, we're going to hand over to you. Expertly guided towards independence. Towards independence. That's what we're expanding on another. This is great. Vladen, over to you. Um, intense and illuminating. Intense and illuminating. That's brilliant. Thank you. And Patrick, lastly. It, it is dynamic and comprehensive. Dynamic and comprehensive. Brilliant. Now, great words. Thank you so much. So the last thing for me to do is just to thank you very much for joining our session. So Bladen, Kalstaff, Ben and Patrick, thank you so much for joining today. It's been a really insightful discussion. Um, I've really enjoyed the session. Um, so thank you very much to everyone watching as well. As I said, you will find these recordings up on YouTube very soon. So do keep an eye out if you'd like to watch them back. I hope you all have a lovely day and, and thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.